Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to our today's webinar session. As we already promised last Thursday, we continue to talk about video technology. Last Thursday, we talked about VSAS and today our topic is thermal technology, thermal imaging, imaging technology. My guest is Mr. Tony Holloway, who is working as a video technology expert at 360 Vision Technology, which is a UK-based company. And he will tell us more about uh, video thermal technology. Hello, Mr. Tony. How are you? Good afternoon. Very well, thank you. And thank you for having me. Uh, great to hear that. Uh, I just introduce you to our audience. So if you are ready, you can start with the presentation. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, I guess it's appropriate in these circumstances to actually present myself in thermal mode. So just so we can see the comparison, um, here I am with a thermal uh, webcam. As you can see, my glass is nice and dark and you can't see the background already straight an introduction into thermal technology. But before we go any further into looking into more of this, I'd like to present a little bit about 360 Vision Technology so you know who we are as an organization, as a manufacturer. So a short video presentation, if I may. So 360 Vision Technology, we are a UK manufacturer. We design all our products in the UK. We assemble all those products in the UK and we support them in the UK. Our factory is in Runcorn, which is in Cheshire. It's up in the northwest of the country, a little south of Liverpool. So you can see here the courtesy of Google Maps exactly where we are. So we're very proud of the fact that our UK manufactured technology, which we supply on an international basis into many different types of vertical market. And here in this video, you see an examples of those vertical markets in terms of critical national infrastructure and defense and utilities, typically demanding high end type applications, but also such as public space and other areas where you do find surveillance camera technology, which could be within transportation, such as highways and railways, etc. Places where surveillance equipment need to withstand the rigors of the particular environment, plus the applications can be somewhat challenging in terms of long range and in terms of the environment, such as extending we see here to offshore, such as wind farms, marine based onboard ships, etc. Not excluding within inside our technology range, other applications going as far into public space, which we are very popular here with the United Kingdom. Rapid deployment as well is also an area and mobile solutions such as on vehicle. And here we're showing examples of border security, education, and also stadia. So it's widespread where our products are actually used, which means we have many different types and variations within our products, and they include different technologies within. So we have within that range, not only visual cameras, but thermal cameras as well. Now here's a short video of our factory in Runcourt. Just giving you an idea of some footage taken a few years ago now, um, show some cameras on test as part of our assembly process, all cameras go through this thorough soap test process where they're all constantly sent through their paces because our products are warranted for a 100% duty cycle, which means they could be turned on and operated as you see these units here constantly, and that is fully warranted. In actual fact, as standard, that's a three year warranty on our products. Now, just to prove they are actually hand assembled, here's some images of some individuals actually at the factory and showing the products actually being put together. As you can see here, gaskets being placed onto one of our camera units with the long range illumination. And you also see here bearings being fitted. So large, rugged bearings being mounted inside our units, which is all part of the criteria in ensuring that the product has a very long life and can withstand the 100% duty cycle in all sorts of conditions. Now at the factory, which has recently been expanded, this whole manufacturing process is essentially raw components in one side of the factory and finished products out the other side. And you get an idea here of the extensive nature of all the production bays that are in place. We also produce our own lighting. 
and the lighting part of it gives us huge flexibility as to the wavelengths and the different lenses we apply onto our units. Here you can see a pick and place machine, which is part of that process of assembling the illuminators onto our PCBs with various different uh, lenses on the front of those, giving different angles. You can see them right here, all lined up on the shelf. So that's just a quick snapshot, really, uh, behind 360 Vision Technologies factory and the fact that we produce all these products of very many different shapes and sizes. And this next slide we'll actually come to will just give you a flavour of some of those different shapes and sizes and colours in actual fact, um, because all our products can be produced in a range of colours should that be the required for the application. So on the far left hand side of this slide, we can see a very odd looking product, which is our Predator radar. This is where we're combining radar technology with the PTZ technology and illumination and thermal if required. And as you go across the bottom of this slide, these units, which have different attachments, different cameras on them, you'll also notice a number of them are actually supporting thermal cameras, which is the subject of our presentation today. As we go around to the far right hand side, we can see a unit there with long range illumination, a visual camera and thermal, which we'll be looking at some video footage from, um, but not to exclude top right hand corner, rugged fixed cameras for applications, which again are highly demanding, and that can be with visual cameras or thermal. And you can also see some dome cameras in the range there as well. Well, I think that's enough for the moment about 360 Vision technology as an organization and the many features and benefits that we do actually boast that we'd love to share with you perhaps another time. Let's get on to the core of our presentation today, which is really looking at the thermal technology. So we've put together this agenda. I hope it's going to be very informative for you. And we're starting from a platform of really looking at well, what is thermal technology, because I'm sure we've all come across thermal technology, we've seen thermal technology, uh, it's been around for many years, etc. But really the understanding of the technology behind that I always find is really important to assist in actually applying the technology to appropriate applications to actually solve a problem uh, which may exist. And so to do that, we're really going to, well, as I say here, get to know thermal technology with some examples of how the camera actually operates and then go through the basic principles into applications and then specifically for security applications where we're looking to use thermal with some application examples. And we'll round up on a Q&A session at the end. So without any further ado, why thermal? Well, thermal really comes into play as an addition to, not necessarily alternative, to the standard surveillance products when we look at it from a security application. So what we're showing here is a camera mounted at a location the location happens to be in Scotland, Loch Ness, and we're looking to the far shore. So you can get an idea from this sort of Google Earth overview at 1.4 kilometres to the north shore of Loch Ness. And here's a still frame of the HD visual camera zoomed into that far shore. And no trouble at all in getting high quality images from that camera in the daytime. And we can clearly see here it's a beautiful day when these images were taken. Now, when it comes to nighttime, our visual camera can be used in monochrome mode. So at nighttime, here's the example within the monochrome mode. Now, because of where we are in Scotland, it is super dark. So there is a, there's no moon, there's no stars out on this particular uh, evening. There is no ambient light. So we can see here, IR illumination has been added to the actual camera. It's turned that island usually on and we can see the trees. If we zoom in a little further, we can now see the detail of the fence line and we can pick out the individual wires and the power stanchion, etc. And we still see the trees, but we can't help but notice the center of the image is utterly black. So although the IR illuminations are turned on, there is nothing within a range of those to actually reflect light back into the camera. So we really aren't seeing anything at all. So this is where thermal technology comes into play. So here is the image from the thermal camera from the very same period of time. So it almost looks like a daytime monochrome image from a visual camera. This thermal camera is set up that anything is cold is essentially shown in a light color and everything which is warm is shown in a dark color, which is why we can see the very cold uh, lock, the water from there and the far bank, which is warmer, 
is actually shown in a darker color. So it looks like daytime. So straight away, we can now see how much thermal actually brings. Another example using a side by side comparison on the left hand side, we have the visual spectrum camera. It's in monochrome mode with some IR illumination and it's looking in to the campsite area. And on the right hand side, we have the thermal uh, spectrum camera. So the two compared side by side, we can see so much more with the thermal camera all the way up the side of the mountain, which is uh, beyond the capability of the visual camera because of the restricted illumination. You can also see on the thermal cameras, the little black dots on the grass in the foreground there, which happen to be hares or rabbits happen to be out. So straight away, we're picking out some heat sources that aren't obvious on the visual camera. So that's why we bring thermal in, because there are applications where it can see so much further. But the technology is very different to the visual camera, which is responding to light. So we're going to take a look at uh, the thermal from the point of view of how it actually responds from a camera in comparison to visual. And this first slide is a very good example of that straight away. Here we have a thermal image of a front of a car. Um, I'm sure you can recognize this as a, as a car. You have a name badge on the front, it has a grill, etc. It's very obviously a car, so we can pick that out from the thermal camera. But what is missing from this image is the actual registration plate. It is there, we can see about where it is, but we don't see any detail from that registration plate because the thermal camera is just seeing the radiated temperature, if you like, from the actual registration plate and the surface doesn't have those characters on it. They're embedded with inside the actual plate itself. There is also an oval badge on the front of the unit, which here it just appears as, as black. And we can just see the headlights to the side. We can't see into the headlights, but most notably the windscreen. We're not seeing into the vehicle. What we're actually seeing is a reflection of the sky. So there's a mixture there of blue sky and clouds, which is what that pattern is we're seeing on the front of the vehicle. So really important to actually understand how thermal actually reacts to the different uh, field of view of the items within that, that field of view. So as an example, I've got some ideas here to actually show you some comparisons of objects that we see in the visual world and comparing those with in the thermal world. So to do that, we'll put the thermal camera back on again. Uh, and you can see straight away by comparing and looking at myself, you can't see through my glasses. And so my glasses are plastic on, on the front. So you're not seeing through those. There's a mixture here really of the temperature which is on them and a degree of reflectance from those glasses. Uh, you can also see in terms of the heat temperature, it's hotter around my mouth being a, a brighter color in this particular hue. Uh, and my nose is rather cold, it would have seen um, at the moment with it being a darker color, more matching to the actual background. Now, this is all about the emissivity. The emissivity is essentially the amount of radiated energy from any given surface. So in thermal terms, we talk about a black body, something which is a perfect emissivity. If you were looking at the surface temperature of that black body, um, essentially emissivity of one means that you are purely seeing the surface temperature of that particular unit. If I had something which was reflective so a perfect reflector would have an emissivity of zero because you can't tell the temperature of the reflector. You're just looking at a reflected temperature from other objects around. So an example of this um, can actually be if we look at sorry, I'm sorry, another form of plastic. Um, here we have some goggles. So you can see straight away from a thermal point of view in front of my face. You can see through them because they're clear and visual, but you can't see through them at all. From a thermal point of view and that's just the uh, the clear plastic very similar to my glasses uh, we take a look at some tin foil for example so here's some uh, tin foil reflecting around the room but from a thermal point of view you can see it's actually um, a reflection of temperature around not necessarily the temperature of the items because the reflective is constantly changing as i move the thermal around paper is quite an interesting one in terms of the example as well. This is a plain sheet of paper, of course, I can put in front uh, my face. You can get the temperature of this uh, paper where it is on the actual screen. But as my hands are actually on this paper, um, you're just looking at the surface temperature. Now my hand is behind, so you can just now see my fingers actually coming through. If I take my fingers away, that's now being left behind the actual thermal the point. And to make it even worse, if I up to my face of course it immediately changes so it's interesting in fact that the surface temperature 
because this is so thin, is actually changing very slightly. The thermal camera actually picks that up quite admirably. Uh, another example, perhaps something thermal camera sees straight through plastic and plastic foil, etc. And there we are. So we can see straight through that, no trouble at all. The thermal camera pretty much sees through it as well. So no trouble actually seeing through sort of a, a film material. But in terms of not being able to see through things, um, here's a drink, of course, I have our, on the, the side here. Um, of course, in visual land, it's just a drink. You have no idea how high the liquid is. But in thermal land, it's measuring the surface temperature, which is very much different in terms of where the liquid actually is and where the air is at the top where the liquid isn't. So again, another way of detecting with, with thermal. But that's quite interesting, even more so when you come and look at perhaps water. Um, and I have here a bag of water. Be careful with it bringing it, bringing it up. So here's is the clear part of the bag at the top. But as you bring the water up quite significantly, you're unable to actually see through water. We are seeing the surface temperature of the water. So visually, you can see through it, um, but you can't see through it from a thermal point of view. So that's some really important characteristics there in terms of a thermal camera as to what it's going to see. So things essentially which are wet could be quite challenging from the point of view. Um, you're just looking at that, that surface. They may be masking things. Uh, it's also worth uh, knowing, of course, not seeing through plastics, etc. cetera. Uh, that really affects, affects the lens um, that you might be using on a thermal camera, which we're going to look at in a moment. Um, and of course, with those different surface uh, temperatures, you need to be mindful of times of day and how hot things are perhaps in the sun with respect to uh, the things you're interested in detecting. So it's possible that uh, surface temperature of uh, something you wish to detect may blend into a background at a certain time of day. So interesting there, hopefully, in terms of the way a uh, thermal actually operates. But let's just get a little bit more technical, really, in terms of describing um, the capability in terms of thermal with some sort of basic principles on, on wavelength. What, what are we actually talking about? Because the, the visual light that, that we see and uh, the classic surveillance camera uh, CMOS sensor chip actually operates uh, to is within a particular band, uh, which is very close to the human eye in terms of the band. But of course, that uh, silicon actually goes a little bit further. It goes up into the IR uh, band. So we have a situation here where the wavelengths um, are changing and the sensitivity of the sensor is appropriate uh, to that. So we start from the visual light and we go up to what we call the, the near infrared area. Um, we then progress into what is known as short wave, so short wave IR. So that's when we first start to really talk about thermal technology in terms of we're thermal because we're talking about temperature, but what it actually is, is the technology of the sensor sensing a particular wavelength which is being emitted by the objects and as we go through that range we have the medium wave all the way to the uh, long wave and the long wave is of particular interest to us about 8 to 14 micrometer wavelengths now that's particularly of interest to us because it is those wavelengths uh, which are emitted by people and things uh, that we might be interested in, so animals, persons, vehicles that have recently driven it, etc., within that particular wavelength. So there's a, a series of technology which is tuned within that wavelength for detection purposes, which is the thermal camera you've just been looking at me on is within that uh, long wavelength. Then beyond that, we have the far IR of anything greater than uh, 15 micrometers. So as the, uh, the frequency uh, decreases from the visual range. This is where we have our thermal area. Important to know in terms of that particular wavelength, I already mentioned the long wave IR, the actual temperature from a, a human is right on 10 micrometers. So from that point, the uh, long wave is a very popular choice within security. And of course, there is volume in that particular product has made them very cost effective indeed. It's worth noting, though, however, uh, you've been looking at me on a thermal camera, extremely close range. And thermal is known for being able to do very long range, several kilometers in terms of detection. Uh, and that's important depending on what sort of sensor you have with inside of the uh, unit. So we're going to look at the different types of, of sensors that are available, uh, which is also specific to range. Bearing in mind that certain sensors and certain atmospheric conditions will limit the capability of the thermal. So in terms of everything which is in the atmosphere is all adding to the thermal signature which is which is out there.
So taking a look at the type of detector uh, that are available, um, and we'll start with essentially the, the top end. So you have the ability of taking a thermal sensor and we have it cooled essentially. So we're reducing the temperature of the actual sensor, which gives it the ability to be far more sensitive within the ranges that we are we are interested in. So from this point of view, a cooled sensor, and as an example of one of our Predator PTZ units on the right hand side there, well, there appears to be a colossal housing on the top because that's all about the essentially the cooling capability behind the thermal sensor. So a large shield to protect it from the actual sun and the Peltier coolers, et cetera, inside there to keep it all cool. And the huge advantage of this is it's very sensitive indeed. Uh, very fast response times in terms of giving you real-time video without any smearing, et cetera, on the actual screen. And therefore, you get very long range. So uh, multiple kilometers in terms of distance of detecting a heat source. The disadvantage of uh, this particular setup, well, one would be the life of the, the product. We're not talking about something which lasts, uh, you know, 20, 30 years. Uh, we're something which is much less than that in terms of the fact that it does require uh, maintenance and renewing to make sure it's in top performance. Um, because of the cooling requirements, it also uses quite a lot of power as well. And I guess the one thing I've not mentioned here is the cost. This is the more expensive end in terms of the uh, security surveillance uh, industry, in terms of the, uh, the technology that you might apply having a cooled device. So the alternative is uncooled device. Uh, much more popular, of course, um, means that the device can be much smaller because we don't have all the, uh, the cooling uh, equipment associated with it. It's also thus much lower power because we are just powering uh, the core itself without any uh, cooling elements being required. And as such, it's also lower cost again because of the actual volume. Um, we need to understand what the payoff is here, of course. Uh, one of those is essentially the non-uniformity correction. Uh, now, the uniformity correction is when a thermal imager essentially has to pause and refresh the actual screen. And so essentially it's almost um, taking a, a moment not to display video before it then gives you the next uh, session of video. And different uh, thermal sensors will actually do this uh, correction at different varying modes of time. So for example, it may happen every few seconds on some sensors. It could be a few minutes or even longer on others. But essentially, it means there is a moment where it's going to pause and it's only going to, not going to be able to give you live video whilst it actually does that, uh, that refresh. Uh, the response time in terms of the uh, uncooled thermal is a little bit slower. So you do get a little bit of smearing essentially on the screen. It's not to any great uh, concern, um, but it is something to be wary of if you're really looking at super fine detail, looking to look into that in terms of the, uh, the application. Uh, and it's also a little bit more uh, susceptible to atmospheric conditions. So depending on the uh, humidity in the actual air and the distance that you're actually looking at your target, they're all going to impact the capability of that thermal sensor. However, the cost uh, basis of such uh, really does outweigh many of those concerns. So taking a look at res resolution. Now, unlike resolutions we are used to in the visual world where we are in now talking about megapixel cameras uh, you know starting from our sort of full hd to megapixel and, and onwards we're used to very super high resolution from the surveillance solution or even our, our everyday camera devices the thermal technology um, really just isn't at that particular uh, level and pretty much that's a mixture really to do with uh, necessity uh, in terms of application and the technology involved in being able to create and present that sort of resolution. So you can see here, uh, in terms of sensing devices, uh, courtesy of FLIR, these images here, and compared in terms of size, as you can see there, uh, which happens to be with a, a pound coin, obviously very similar in size to a euro, we can see how very small some of these sensors, in actual fact, can be. So that uh, unit you can see right there on the screen, actual size compared with that coin, that is a FLIR lepton, which happens to be the sensor you were looking at me on uh, just a moment ago. So resolutions are uh, quite spread here. High resolution is considered sort of the 640 by 512 uh, resolution format, um, all the way down to the lower res, which is what, again, you were, you were looking at me on, um, but all within sort of an affordable range in terms of sensor. 
Now, I say affordable range in terms of the sensor because that element is relatively affordable. Um, the part of the sensor which tends to push the cost up happens to be the lens. And this is really about the fact that you can't use glass, as we've probably demonstrated, and you can't see through my, my glasses, the thermal image is on the surface. So a lens is not along the lines of the uh, conventional lens that we use on surveillance camera. So it has to be used at uh, created out of different materials and those materials require a lot of manufacturing so we have uh, uh, specialist items uh, that are then ground down and created uh, to make the uh, lens so it's quite a complex process and if you can imagine a lens such as this one you see on screen the large lens the 100 millimeter lens from FLIR, um, the creation of that lens is quite complex. There's a lot of material with inside that, that all has to be perfectly aligned. Uh, and then you've got the, the small lepton, which is a much smaller lens in the front that aids being very cost effective because the amount of material, it's much less, of course. However, it is the quality of that lens that really delivers the quality of the uh, image. The same with visual cameras, really. The best lens that lets a lot of light through from a visual camera for point of view it's very similar in terms of the, the thermal quality of the lens really makes a huge difference uh, to the capability of the uh, thermal sensor so just an idea there in terms of the different technologies which are uh, available and where the costings are coming in in terms of uh, criteria um, something we really need to pay attention to when it comes to thermal technology are some of the controls that are in place with respect to the use of this technology and there are various manufacturers on an international uh, basis, but I've, I've highlighted here really from the USA, UK and Europe from the point of view of controlling the export of thermal devices. And it tends to come under the process of what's known as dual use. Essentially, thermal technology, because of its capability of being able to uh, pick out targets at great range, um, tends to be and can be used in weapons targeting systems. So it's important that we don't have such technology um, all over the, the world, essentially. So there are controls in place on this. Now, one of the very straightforward ways in terms of uh, controlling the use of thermal technology is to change that technology where it is suitable for our security market um, and unsuitable for uh, other markets that may be using it. So. The thermal sensors are, tend to be available in two formats in terms of frame rate, i.e. the number of images per second that are actually delivered through the uh, sensor itself. So for applications, essentially, which are on a security sphere, uh, limited to nine hertz, so just a few images per second, uh, perfectly suitable for security applications, um, but really no good at all for weapon systems. So what that actually means in uh, effect is essentially you have um, real-time video, but it's not actually delivering real-time to you straight away. So giving a, an example here of the thermal image, so the left-hand side image there, you can see a thermal image with a boat moving across the actual screen, and it's stepping, essentially. It's running at 9 hertz. You're getting about, uh, under this encoded signal, it's about six images per second you're actually seeing there. As compared to what would be the visual camera, the same piece of video, where it was a smooth piece of video from the point of view is that it's 25 images per second. So we can see here from these two example images, and actually I'll run that um, again for you here. So what we should see is one of those in parallel, you'll see them side by side. So we have one on the left is uh, stepping because it's a thermal image and the one on the right should be smooth. Hopefully that's coming across on our presentation here. Um, however, you're still gaining all the information you wish to from those those videos. So we got an idea there in terms of the thermal technology, uh, in terms of the basic principles and the component parts to it. We now really need to look at the application. And to look at the application, we take a, a little step back um, because any security application actually needs to start with the need. And so a bit of a wordy side here, just to come back and say, well, OK, um, if I have a security application, that application is really being defined by an operational requirement. The operational requirement for a site, for a facility, etc., is all about 
analyzing the need, analyzing the threat, identifying what the targets may be. And you're honing down the, the security application. And of course, there's lots of things to consider when doing um, that operational requirement, which could be access control and fencing and physical security and alarms and conventional CCTV, et cetera. And you may come to a point where you go, okay, this particular application needs uh, thermal, thermal cameras. Um, from a visual camera point of view, we talk very specifically about having test targets and being able to uh, identify a target at a certain distance. Uh, we talk about how large that target needs to be perhaps on screen or how large that target needs to be in terms of the number of pixels per meter or pixels on that target as far as the recording system is concerned. So uh, the subject's quite, quite deep. So we're not going to dwell on it a huge amount, but we're touching on it here because this is really framed around the visual world, which we may be very useful to in terms of seeing an image on screen and whether you can identify someone or whether you're just detecting or whether you're recognizing someone who's been previously identified or even inspection. So there's there's uh, standards, etc., that we can work towards uh, from that point of view. So looking at the visual side, we essentially say that a certain target site, so if this was a, an individual 1.7 meter high uh, target, there could be a number of pixels on that target from a visual point of view, using the visual camera, uh, which would represent a certain percentage screen height. And we tie in here um, particular terminology from the point of view of just monitoring, uh, detection, all the way through to actually inspect. So I put this in class because we're comparing this with thermal technology, which is very different. Now, the thermal technology is actually governed by something called Johnson criteria. Now, because thermal technology isn't based around the gathering of evidential footage that we're often used in surveillance systems, where we are very interested in particularly, you know, someone's characteristics of their actual face and what they're wearing and all the colors, etc., that come with that, and exactly what they're doing, what tools they they may be they may have. From the Johnson criteria point of view, um, it only takes a very few pixels to be able to identify um, that there is someone there and actually classify who they are, which means that we can actually detect there's something with just a few pixels. So the terminology is, is mixed between the actual two here. Now, what you're seeing on screen at the moment is a test target, which is known as a, a thermokin. Uh, and essentially a test target really needs to be uh, tied and appropriate to um, the application. So there's no hard and fast rules, but there certainly is guidance here uh, in the UK as an appropriate test target when you're dealing with thermal. But what, of course, you're looking for is a variation in radiated temperature. And specifically, of course, if you are wanting to detect individuals, then you're going to need something around that particular temperature as well. So this is just an example on screen, and it gives you an idea of the number of pixels on target if you're following Johnson criteria. Now, looking at that specifically, we said detection, so one or two, and see some examples of that. So that's just a pixel or two on target to say there's someone there or something there of, of, uh, of interest. You then have recognition, essentially, is it a person or is it a car? So just eight pixels on target. So that's not very many at all, which is really why we get that tremendous range. And when it comes to identification, that isn't actually identifying an individual as you'd see in sort of uh, surveillance, uh, visual surveillance setup. That's really about deciding, well, yes, if it is a vehicle, what sort of vehicle is it? A lorry, a van, a car, for example. So different type of classifications. So just, just sort of comparing those two together really side by side, they probably fit around this area. No particular hard and fast rule, but it, what is important here is to pick out that if we're identifying something, 250 uh, pixels on target in terms of that terminology, uh, that's really more like recognized from a, from a visual world. So an interesting comparison between the two to be uh, aware of. Now, let's just look at some of those ranges that are capable with thermal. So here we're, we're classing long wave, uh, again, borrowing this from, from FLIR, uh, using their TAU 200 millimeter. These are the sort of maximum distances to be able to uh, observe those detection ranges. So we have detection, which is just that one or two pixels on targets, potentially a vehicle six kilometers away uh, from the actual camera. So there's a really good distance there. I would caveat that by saying that's ideal conditions that you get that sort of distance. And of course, um, we don't necessarily always have ideal conditions, but important in here, we've still got that sort of 2000 
500 meters for for a person we then move on to the recognition all the way down to identification so still at a kilometer there identification or 350 meters identification as far as persons are concerned as well so some very long distances are capable here using thermal thermal technology so an example in practice so here we have some uh, thermal imaging footage and what we're seeing here is essentially a thermal camera this is actually 35 millimeter on a 640 resolution FLIR device and we are actually looking at a beachfront so we can see the uh, the waves slowly rippling in on the waterfront and we're looking back towards the shoreline and so we can get an idea here in terms of the actual refresh so again we're on this sort of nine hertz setup um, we're actually looking over a kilometer away here uh, and as you get used to sort of looking at this style of video you can start to pick out quite a few people that are moving around on the uh, on the beach front and on the walkways etc now this pans to the left and so the scene actually slowly gets closer and closer and closer to the camera so we'll be able to actually start to pick out more information about individuals and you should be able to see now on sort of the left of the screen where we're about uh, sort of 400 meters away some people there which are just uh, paddling in the water on the uh, on the front here so you can see the waves actually coming in partly of course you're looking at the temperature of the actual water some reflection and then we can see the various buildings on top of the uh, the bank and the uh, the cliff face to this actual beach area and then the sky is very dark beyond so the temperature range we're dealing with here is anything which is warm is being shown in a in a lighter color and everything is cold is in a darker color so if you can see on this piece of video someone's actually paddling in the water in the uh, in the front there they can easily be picked out without any trouble whatsoever in terms of uh, what they might actually be uh, what I'd be up to so if I just move that on a little bit here this uh, video we can see if we get all the way further to the left there we get it there now we can we're about 250 uh, meters here at this particular point and we can see some uh, individuals playing games on the on the waterfront so it gives you an idea of the sort of clarity that's being delivered by the thermal camera however it isn't actually giving you any sort of evidential footage in terms of identifying any particular person or vehicle etc um, that may be within the scene but still very useful from that point of point of view so let's take a look at some specifics within this uh, example so here we have the freeze frame image from the thermal camera and we're looking to identify people at one kilometer so a thousand meters away from the actual camera picking out people and that is essentially that sort of area on the beachfront if I should make that a little bit bigger on screen I've got a feeling my little avatar is going to cover up exactly what I want to show you here on your side you've got my head actually in the way of what I was looking to show you on the uh, on the actual uh, screen but essentially we have there we are just above it three little dots in a row so we're at this sort of one kilometer we're just a few pixels on target but that is giving us the ability to actually detect um, individuals at one kilometer and 35 millimeter lens um, on this uh, beach front if we want sort of more detail about what's going on we need to come a little bit closer so we're now at this sort of 250 meters uh, from the actual camera itself and if we sort of highlight this area that's sort of 250 meters there are two individuals in the scene we just make it a little bit bigger on screen and those uh, two individuals i'm covering one of them up um, but you have uh, essentially to the left um, a child compared with an adult on the right there so sufficient pixels and target to be able to you know recognize that yes that these are actual people and, and then to be able to classify essentially uh, who they are as well uh, also on this image just to the to the to the left um, you can see an individual walking uh, forward as well happens to be looking at their phone as they're walking forward so again enough information to see what they're uh, potentially up to so that classification would certainly give you an idea if they had any particular intent perhaps so there's some examples from the point of view 
of thermal camera just picking out targets but we need to look at the specifics of security application of course they are wide widespread anywhere where you're looking to detect individuals at uh, long range which is very typically perimeter solutions where i can mount a camera look a long distance and i'm specifically interested in vehicles and people that may be coming uh, to that perimeter and looking to uh, breach that in some way so classic applications for thermal technology. So listing those down, what we're really interested in from this point of view is the ability to put a detection device in place, which I could perhaps link in to some form of automation. And thermal is very good at that because it, what we're interested in, perhaps which is people, it will make them really stand out on the actual screen, making it far easier from a video analytic engine point of view to actually pick those targets out and then provide additional analysis as to what those targets are doing as to whether that would create an exception condition, an alarm, for example, from that point on. So we have the ability of long range uh, using the uh, non-cooled thermal long wave. We are essentially very low power as, as well, so it doesn't create um, a huge amount of, of need for power at the locations uh, because we're using thermal we're not having additional illumination which could create a lot of power of course in terms of the visual world so there's an, an advantage from from that that point of view so there's some really strong reasons why thermal technology um, really gives a strong advantage over visual technology in terms of detection and potentially of course in also all weather conditions when compared with visual camera technology However, although there are advantages, and I'm going to pick on a few of those as well, um, thermal on its own doesn't answer all, all the questions. Um, here we have some, some advantages uh, presented to you here. For example, a couple of freeze images from a typical perimeter security application. What we can see on the right hand image is the monochrome image from a camera which is supported by IR illumination and you can't help but uh, notice in the distance there seemed to be a very bright light shining back at the camera so the visual camera is actually picking up the uh, thermal lighting from the particular site and you know potentially interfering with the actual camera itself whereas on the thermal to the left it's not even there so there's no heat signature from that light it's not been seen at all Whereas the individual, in this case on the right, happens to be wearing a high visibility jacket. So they are actually standing out from a point of view of the visual camera. On the left, of course, you're getting the thermal signature from the individual. You're not getting any glow from the actual jacket. You're actually just reading the uh, thermal signature really back from that individual. Um, you will also notice a few other little likes on that left hand side image, which is the local wildlife, which happens not to be showing up on the right hand side but the main thing to take away from here is, of course is that lighting you don't need the lighting with the thermal setup and the lighting is not interfering with the thermal camera that is in place for the uh, the visual camera another strong advantage from the thermal point of view is the ability to see through mist and smoke etc so here's an example where we're showing on the right hand side a smoke bomb which is being let off and on the left hand side what we have is the same image in thermal and we can see here the smoke's having no impact uh, whatsoever and so you can see the two videos are actually synchronized we can see from a thermal point of view two individuals up to no good uh, climbing up a ladder on the side of this particular um, aircraft planting a device whereas obviously behind the smoke can't be seen in the visual but at this point you can as this is just a, a demonstration but what we are seeing on the visual camera quite importantly is a, some information that you're not getting getting on the thermal such as perhaps the color of that vehicle um, the actual make of the vehicle we're picking out and there could be additional information about the two individuals uh, performing that act as they were so hugely beneficial having the thermal camera but at the same time not actually answering all the questions you really do need the uh, visual camera to complement that uh, another example of thermal which i kind of touched on already really in showing you the uh, the bag of water earlier is really that comparison in different weather conditions so here we have uh, two thermal images of a uh, vehicle same vehicle same place slightly different time of day the first image on the left is raining 
So the vehicle is actually wet at this particular point, recently been driven. So the front of the vehicle is glowing a little white there. So we've got heat from the actual engine and the wheels and the tires. But the general body of the actual car is, is rather grayed out, rather pastel. And it's blending quite a bit in with the background as well. Whereas the right hand image, again, vehicle recently uh, driven, but on a clear day, we can see things like the chrome strip, which is around the windows, is very dark. Now that's because it's reflecting the sky at this point. So you're actually seeing the temperature of the sky, not the actual temperature on that vehicle. And you can also see quite a patterning as well, as even the metal paint finish is actually reflecting other um, temperatures around the actual vehicle itself. So what we can see here, again, in the, the background on the left hand side is that it's very grayed out because everything's wet and it's raining. Uh, whereas on the right, we're very bright to the left there where the sun is out actually shining on those areas and areas which are in the shade on the right is different. So that's quite a difference in terms of the exactly the same scene, but just because one image is raining and damp and wet and the other one is actually on a, a clear day. So you can see there's quite a comparison there between uh, those those two. So um, that was sort of the security applications, but before we actually move on and actually jump into some examples of the uh, thermal operating and security applications, uh, as we're talking about thermal, we probably really need to touch on some other sort of applications of thermal. Uh, one of those being, um, as we see here, the ability to monitor individuals' uh, temperature um, for detection as to whether someone is feeling anxious, perhaps, um, that can easily be done with thermal technology. So there's an example here of actually using this to actually monitor someone's temperature. Now, what's important about this particular image is that you can actually see it referenced against what we would uh, term to be the uh, black body. So the yellow box on screen here is our fixed reference temperature. So you have the ability with thermal to actually compare a known temperature, we know exactly what it is, with the surrounding area. And of course, this actually can be used in, in many, many different applications, not only with uh, with individuals, but can also be used in machinery. So essentially actually looking at uh, equipment that's operating to as to what temperature is actually reaching to make sure it's operating in an optimum band and it doesn't go into a, a critical band. So an example here for, is uh, looking at componentry on PCB. So it could be motor drivers and things like that that uh, need to be kept inside a certain temperature. They don't get driven too hard. So from the point of view of, of fault detection or even in the design and application of security products again thermal cameras uh, can be used to uh, aid this process to making sure longevity of, of product just another example here uh, images courtesy of micro uh, epsilon uh, another example of course fire detection we couldn't really go any further without also just touching on that as a, an application the ability for thermal technology to monitor if an area is getting too hot and it has the potential to spontaneously combust. A uh, quick example here showing in a sort of waste processing, we have a visual cameras on the left hand side seeing waste processing bins, but on the right hand side, we're monitoring using thermal technology, the actual temperature of those as well. So again, another application, which really does lead to, with all these different applications, many different shapes and sizes of, of product and also thermal sensors to actually meet those applications. So, you know, examples such as we have here, all different shapes and sizes of uh, thermal cameras uh, in terms of PTZ cameras mixed together. So different lenses, giving different fields of views, uh, mixing in visual cameras and thermal cameras at the same time. Uh, and it just doesn't stop at that in terms of also materials as well. So whether it's stainless steel or aluminium, the different ways they, they can be mounted. So it's very widespread to meet all these different applications. Uh, and also down to really what you're, you're looking at. Um, in this uh, next slide, an example of a thermal camera actually used for monitoring wildlife. And in this particular case, mounted in a tree. So specifically actually camouflaged. So the actual camera itself fully camouflaged and it's in the center of that particular image mounted up in the tree. So again, further applications for uh, thermal technology, depending on what you're looking at. It's not always about security, but security, is really the sort of uh, the main thrust of what we're talking about today. And there's a particular thing when it comes to the security application in the detection and monitoring off, because there's a, there's two ways of going about this. You either have your machine uh, learning really in the background, uh, essentially doing the detection, or you have an operator physically looking at the screen. 
which is hopefully what I encourage you to do right now in terms of looking at the screen and these very simple uh, boxes, uh, box A and box B, which if you're looking at those, um, should hopefully appear to be different shades. And what's interesting about this particular slide is the fact that those two boxes are not different shades. They're the same shade. Um, and I can highlight this on this next slide by turning the background of this slide to a single color, in this case, just white. So now hopefully box A and box B actually do look to be the same shade because they are the same shade. Uh, if I put the back of the slide uh, background to this sort of gradiated uh, look, then A and B appear to be different. Now, this is all because of the interpretation of the human eye in terms of looking at a grayscale it's not very good at seeing a constant in terms of that grayscale, i.e. a particular shade. You can't actually pitch it at any particular point. Uh, and sort of to prove this a little bit further, those box A and B, which are probably looking rather different, if I actually scoop them together on screen, they are clearly the, the same shade. Um, but even now, you may see that those boxes perhaps appear a little bit darker at the bottom than they do at the top. If I just ring fence them with another color, hopefully they become all uniform. Now, the reason for going through this little bit of uh, example of showing the, the shades is because when you're looking at thermal images, which are just essentially black and white grayscales, you really can't rely on your human eye interpretation of whether you are genuinely seeing a target or not. And this is because of the example we've just shown you that a, a temperature presented within a certain range, um, you may interpret to be something different actually on screen. Becomes really important, particularly when you're dealing with background temperatures compared with your actual target, which could make that difference um, in certain parts of the world uh, and certain times of day, of course. So what we can do is apply to the thermal technology color overlays, which you may have well have, have seen examples of. Um, and there are widespread in terms of what can actually be applied. So here we have some examples of what's known as fusion and rainbow. And this is applying colors to the different bands of temperature uh, suitable to an, to an application. So be it sticking with one particular a shade or actually mixing a whole series of, of those very popular on the rain on the left hand side a very popular uh, shade for applying in thermal we can already see in this same image which we're applying the targets we might be interested in have disappeared in some of these shades whereas in others they're actually uh, standing out a little bit more obviously now one particular of use in security is ice and fire so this is the one on the right hand side and the ice and fire is really about tuning the thermal sensor to pick out the targets that we would be of interest, such as people. Um, so within that temperature range, perhaps highlight those in red. In the same one, it will actually highlight in blue things that are actually colder. So here's a sort of a, a live example of that. We have a, a Google Earth plot. We have a location of where our thermal camera is placed. We have a target uh, 1.25 kilometers away. And we've also got a target a little bit closer here at 150 meters. And if we take a look at that thermal image with the ice and fire applied, what we can see is a tree in the middle of the screen. And then to the left of that screen, we have a collection of red dots. So they're highlighting that temperature range of interest for us. Now, the shape of those red dots at 150 meters was clearly we can see they're animals in a field, they're horses or cows or something. Uh, we know they're not of concern to us. But to the right of the uh, tree, we can see some further red dots. We don't know what those are. Um, so we can now use the visual camera to go and take a look. So we have the wide angle view from the HD visual camera and we can use the powerful zoom on this to take us all the way into the location of those red dots, which happens to be queuing traffic. So there's traffic there creating that heat signature 1.2 kilometers away. But an example, hopefully, to you of mixing that thermal technology for the detection process uh, combined with visually to actually pick up and, and identify uh, what that threat may be. Looking at things a little bit closer and really highlighting now the benefits of the visual combined with the, uh, the thermal technology. Uh, this first one really is just looking at the industrial estate from a color image point of view. We can pick out all sorts of detail that we're interested in. For example, perhaps car registration plates. So 150 meters away, 
visual camera straight in with the zoom lens picking out registration plates uh, make some models of vehicle etc without any trouble at all and it would be the same at night as well with a little bit of ambient light some street light around the capability of the visual camera to pick out individuals no problem at all but let's just compare that with the thermal with the ice and fire applied and this is that very same image we have someone going for a jog and therefore they are being truly highlighted without any issue at all all those red dots is the, uh, the temperature of an individual plus you're also picking out in in the background a few items of the building and cars that have been recently moved so combining these two things together means that when i'm looking in an area which is a little bit more challenging perhaps to actually pick out where there's an individual and a vehicle the thermal camera really presents that quite nicely for us in terms of those uh, that individual as we can see here to the right of the vehicle which has been recently moved and if you didn't need another example here here is one you know without any IR illumination looking across this fieldway it's very dark and sort of noisy image but we can turn on the IR and we can zoom in uh, and we can pick out targets uh, within the range of the actual camera without any trouble at all however in this particular image what we are not seeing is beyond those bushes in the middle of the screen where the thermal image is telling us there is actually someone hiding. In this case, it's just some animals, but of course it could be someone in those bushes and the thermal camera is picking that thermal signature out from that location. So hopefully that really kind of demonstrates that combining of bringing the thermal together. Now, I appreciate we've already had your time for a long time already this morning, but I'd like to finish up on just giving you a demonstration of really linking in the thermal technology with some video analytic capability. And this is really the, the nub essentially of saying, well, OK, let's take a particular set of thermal images. Let's combine those together and then apply a capability of analyzing all the targets within that scene. So here we have an example on and well, some critical national infrastructure in the uh, in the city of London here in the UK, where we are looking at all the individuals that happen to be on on the bridge, and we're also very interested in any vessel vessels that happen to be under the bridge. So essentially, the video analytics are being applied to these three thermal cameras that are all uh, essentially stick to, stitched together as one image, and if uh, it, it detects. An individual with an area of interest it then sends a camera around to go and take a visual uh, look at that particular target so i'll just run this as a piece of uh, a video and essentially this is a, a live situation where you see at the top of the screen we're boxing uh, the various targets and we're putting uh, distance markers next to each of those particular targets uh, as far as we're concerned this is set up that any vessel which is loitering underneath the actual bridge itself uh, is considered to be an alarm and so we then go and take the camera around and look at this now this is a, a setup where a police launch um, deliberately comes and approaches the actual bridge it then actually stages underneath the bridge it tries to hold its position under the bridge and from our point of view here we're considering that a uh, security risk and raise the appropriate alarm but you can see here straight away that the video analytic using the thermal technology which will happily operate 24 7 um, is is well ahead of us here in actually seeing this vessel actually approach the bridge itself we then bring the visual camera in to zoom in on that particular target that gives the detail um, from a visual point of view of who that target is what they're actually up to and of course that can be on 24 uh, ability particularly when you're adding lights and, and various other sort of things to the uh, ptz camera which is going into looking at the vessel so it's really that capability of using thermal technology which gives us that range it gives us that uh, number of pixels on target which are sufficient to identify targets of interest and then applying the video analytic on those targets as to where they're going and what they're doing where they actually are to then rate alarms uh, feed that back into the video management system and if necessary also appropriately drive uh, cameras and other actions and events so hopefully that nicely rounds up uh, for you this uh, little journey we've had today through the uh, thermal capability in terms of the technology which is available in the marketplace so to summarize here um, we looked at the technology in terms of what's available on, on the market but also 
we intersected that small point to say operational requirement. You know, important to understand really before we get to that point, what are the challenges with respect to a site? Do I need the thermal technology? Will it actually be able to deliver for a particular application I have in mind? And of course, then taking that through all the way to the point of with video analytics at the end. And I have put in there um, that summary really about the evidential uh, quality and capability, which is something quite interesting to uh, uh, labor on. If you have a security application, which is actually relying on the gathering of evidence, of course, uh, thermal cameras can be very good at detecting that something was happening, but the backing up of the visual capability with sufficient pixels on target to actually be able to give you evidential quality footage that you could uh, then use afterwards is also a very important part, which you can only sort of bring together with the visual capability as well. So just to end all that video footage you've uh, you've seen there, it's being grabbed from the 360 Vision technology uh, products for which of course there is a very much a, a large range on that slide as we'd previously seen. So I appreciate I've taken a lot of your time, perhaps just past the top of the hour. So uh, if you have any questions, um, I will hold it over to Saeed to, uh, to field those. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you for this presentation. I hope you are not exhausted. Pretty yes, no. <laughs> that went very quickly. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you for this uh, presentation and uh, bringing to us uh, thermal technology and what are these innovations and uh, bringing us the comparison between the thermal cameras and uh, the standard video surveillance uh, cameras. Uh, we have uh, several questions, but uh, before skipping the questions, I hope actually my question first to me uh, for you uh, when it comes to thermal uh, cameras and uh, apart from the thermal imaging uh, what are the advantages comparing to professional video surveillance cameras can we compare them and maybe what's the best solution when it comes to securing perimeter uh, well, hopefully in the, the presentation um, that I've put you today, in actual fact, you can see there are solid advantages to both technologies in terms of the visual technology and the thermal. So although you can use one of those um, for those applications, be it perimeter in their sole application, it really is the combination of the two that gives you the best um, capability in terms of a detection from the thermal capability. Uh, you have the range from the thermal capability, but when it comes to actually gathering evidential information, such as color and identification of your particular targets, uh, reading registration plates, identifiable information from vehicles, etc., you really do need a visual capability, which might need to be enhanced with um, IR illumination or even white light illumination to get you a, a greater range or close to the range of the thermal camera. So yeah, I very much sit in the terms of there isn't a one which is ideal, um, from the point of view that it covers every capability, they all have their own individual's uh, advantages, and it really is combining the best of those together to for the most appropriate solution. Definitely. So uh, the integration would be the answer, actually. Yes, I suppose from a 360 vision point of view, because we also do specialize in integrating the technology together into single heads, then uh, we really do see the advantages of bringing that together. And that could be the visual camera, the thermal camera and the lighting and perhaps even other forms of technology, such as radar, for example, to also guide where targets may be um, in addition to other uh, visual um, imaging capability. So we, we really can bring a lot to the table in a, a single package, uh, making it extremely capable. Definitely. So let's go to our questions. Uh, the first is, uh, what determines the cost and the quality of these thermal cameras? Uh, well, qu quality is, is always uh, an arbitrary point of view from 
the point of view is quality really comes down to whether it actually meets an operational requirement. Does it achieve is certainly one expectation of when it comes to quality. But uh, essentially, um, the actual lens itself, I think, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, has a huge impact in that. So the quality of, of the lens in terms of the ability to deliver uh, the appropriate wavelength onto the actual sensor really does make a, make a difference. Uh, and often in these circumstances, size has an impact. If you think about from a visual point of view, you know, the larger the aperture of the lens, the better the f-stop of the lens, the more it delivers through to the sensor, as well as the actual technology uh, from a sensor point, point of view, are often linked to the finance of the actual, actual unit itself. Thank you, Danny. Uh, the next question is like, what, what should be considered when installing thermal cameras? And what is the a IP rating of these cameras? Well, considered when in installing cameras, um, that's quite a broad question in actual fact, because there are there are many, many elements to, to be considered. But as you mentioned, their IP rating, um, just to take it on that particular basis, of course, it is down uh, to the environment that the cameras are being installed. From a, a 360 vision point of view, the Predator series uh, cameras, uh, we have the capability to deliver units that are IP 68 so in terms of ingress protection um, from debris and from moisture that's the rating the uh, the units are at but we do have to bear in mind with thermal cameras um, the thermal lens itself of course has to be exposed without any additional cover over the top which is made of a glass or a material because you wouldn't see any thermal capability through it so we we do need to bear in mind um, the ingress protection capabilities of the actual lens and how that is sealed um, or you're taking it to a, a step where you're essentially putting what's known as a sacrificial lens onto the front of your thermal move so you could seal the whole device with an additional lens essentially a, a cover germanium cover over the front of the unit which not only provides um, a greater rating in terms of uh, ingress protection but it also means that wear and tear from the environment which will affect the lens means that that can be removed um, still preserving the actual lens itself um, of the thermal camera uh, underneath but there is a there's quite a lot to consider in terms of the environment that you're actually placing the actual cameras into as well and the longevity of the uh, the application but that's probably that's probably quite a deep subject lengthy to get into now Definitely. Uh, the last one, what is the maximum range of the thermal cameras? Probably about these cameras that you presented. Um, well, maximum range of thermal cameras in, in general, um, I, I actual fact is various manufacturers uh, produce technologies then when you uh, essentially find yourself all the way going into the military uh, sphere where you have thermal cameras that can see tens of kilometers uh, with extreme clarity. Uh, but you get into essentially curvature of the earth issues and atmospheric conditions when you do sort of go beyond the sort of the 10 kilometer area, but to quite comfortably thermal cameras can go 35, 40 kilometers in terms of detection ranges, depending on where you are and subject to um, atmospheric conditions. From a, a 360 vision point of view, the technology we use in terms of, of distance, we tend to go up to the uh, long range uh, capability of the FLIR sensors, uh, which would take you up to, I think what I presented in one of my slides, essentially, if you're looking at vehicles that five to six kilometers, uh, spotting individuals two to two and a half kilometers from the actual camera in ideal conditions is the general uh, view. If soon as you go into cooled, then you get to those much greater extended uh, distances. So that it's really, um, of course, down to application, operational requirement, uh, where the threat is in relation to safe areas and where you can uh, provide equipment that will sort of designate the sort of distances that may be required. Uh, we have one uh, more question right now. Uh, it is from uh, our, our colleague Dragan. He said, "Like, does these cameras are able to detect uh, 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 fire in the wood?" Actually, yes, I think that you presented in the presentation. yes, uh, absolutely, yeah. So we, we have the the capability um, to put thermal uh, 
cameras or detectors essentially on the actual uh, PTZ units themselves for the detection of actual fire or near fire, which is really the uh, the point prior to combustion is the uh, the point of action. Um, ideally, before anything catches fire, you raise the alarm that it's going in that direction. But the, yes, the answer is yes, we can do that. And that's one of the slides there was highlighting one of those capabilities. So yes, so basically they are able to detect the fire. Uh, that's all. Uh, okay. From our side, Mr. Tony, thank you very much uh, for your presentation and for your time. Once more, it was really interesting, and uh, this term of technology is definitely here to stay. Uh, I would like also to thank you to our audience, our participants, for coming and joining us today. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, see you next Thursday when we, when we are talking about. Uh, video integration with uh, Catexis company. So thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye.